Hi, everybody. We are so glad to be here today with Dr. Melissa Morgan. She is a choral conductor, an educator, a performer. She works at the University of Regina, where she directs the choirs, uh, conduct, uh, teaches conducting and diction, and her research interests include regionalism through choral compositions in the Canadian Prairie West. And I am very proud to call her a friend and so glad that she is joining us today. Welcome, Melissa. Hi! So, so good, good to see you. you. Yay! I'm First so happy of all, to be here. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, how are you doing? Oh, you know, I'm I'm doing great. I'm I'm like everybody else, uh, staying close to home and uh, getting busy. I did a lot of baking at the beginning of all of this, and now I'm into the garden and uh, also doing a lot of planning for the fall. And how are you planning in the midst of this just so completely unknown uh, world that we're living in? What are your like, what are your parameters? How are you navigating this? This is a selfish question because I need guidance. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's when everything kind of started, I, I anticipated that it might be for the long haul, but I didn't understand that, you know, perhaps in the fall, perhaps... Um, you know, going into the 2021, we still might have to, you know, adjust. And um, so it took some time. I think the first phase of all of this, I had to just mentally make a shift in my mind and understand this is the way that everything is going to be and that I had to be happy with that. And I couldn't look at what was going on as a burden or something bad mm -hmm. or terrible. Like I just had to be thankful that I was in a situation where I could be safe and be healthy and still be with my family. And, and, you know, the worst of it was that I probably ate too much uh, <laughs> <cinnamon> buns <laughs> for me. And I, and I had to be grateful that that was my situation. So, so yeah, there was a little bit of a mental shift and then mm. I began to learn as much as possible. So I I've attended, I think every conference that I can and a lot of webinars and a lot of, I'm a part of a, group uh, a study and we meet weekly um oh, wow. you know like there's there's it's the preparation and now i think i'm beginning into that third stage which is okay i understand what is happening um the truth is nobody knows what is going on and um i'm just going to prepare for online uh teaching because that's what my university has stated that we're going to do and i'm going to do that to the best of my ability with what i have and and we'll take it from there. So, oh, so, I, so I, positive. it's been stages. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I I hear you exactly all the way. Uh, you're so positive, and that's so inspiring. Uh, it's been really hard, like because the and it, the the rules and regulations and predictions, like it seems to be changing daily. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I don't know about you, but I feel more connected to my colleagues across the country and able to like have these conversations. Yeah. Oh my goodness. What are, what are you going to do? How do you teach choir online? Yeah. All of these conversations are so. Yeah. Boring. That, oh. that's been a, that's been a joy uh, because sometimes, you know, you get so like focused on what you are, what you are doing that um, you, you, unless you need something, you don't get a chance to, you know, connect with somebody else. Mm. Um, so yeah, this has been great. There's been a lot of people that I've met that I didn't even know before. And, you know, mm. a, as being part of these groups and talking and, oh, so-and-so did this, why don't you connect with that person? And so, so that's, that's, that's been, a, it's been, it's been good. I think it's been a good thing. I mean, it's not good, but I overall, I think there are some really good moments, uh, takeaways, time to move up to the next level mm -hmm. and <laughs> yeah, leave what was behind behind and move forward. So yeah. Yeah. Sort of forcing us into change and self-reflection and improvement and yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. Okay. So tell us uh, and our listeners about yourself, your story, who inspired you in your life? Why did you get into choral music? Oh. All of that. <laughs> we could be here for four days. <laughs> <laughs> I got time. <laughs> um, okay, well, you know, I'm I'm a Regina girl, so 
I was born in Kitimat. I like to say that because Kitimat is a very small northern BC community that, uh, you know, unless you've been up there, nobody really knows about it. So I, I like to put Kitimat on the map. Um, <laughs> so that's where I was born. But around my first birthday, um, my my mom and dad moved to Regina. My dad was an electrician and he he got a job here. And so uh, they moved. And, and I've lived here ever since. Um, my, my dad passed away when I was about four. And so when that happened, my mom was pregnant with my sister at the time. Mm -hmm. And all of my mom's sisters, uh, well, the majority moved to Regina, including my grandmother to raise uh, me and my sister. Mm -hmm. And um, music has always been in our family. My mom uh, played organ. That's actually how she came to Canada from England. She played for all the churches and there was a church, yeah. <laughs> there was a church meeting here uh, in Toronto, and she loved it. She thought it, you know, being in Toronto was awesome. And um, in those days, you know, you just sent in your application, and a couple of weeks later, you you could <laughs> move to Canada and be a citizen. <laughs> wow. So that's what happened. Anyhow, so yeah, music has always been in the family. My grandmother, she was a. a a teacher, a piano teacher as well. And on my dad's side, actually, a lot of my cousins are jazz musicians um, oh. and gospel musicians. Um, so it, it runs in the family. So so for us, music was not, you know, just a hobby. It was a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was required for my sister and I both to go through all the conservatory levels. And uh, we had to do grade 10. That was like a must. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, no. <laughs> so that's what happened in, in every instrument that we studied in, in flute, uh, piano, voice. Uh, yeah, my, my sister, she just, she was the kind of rebel. So she did the grade 10 for piano, but she was like, I am not doing my ARCT in, in piano. No. <laughs> Anyways, um, so yeah. And <laughs> so she's we, a musician too, right? Yes. Your yeah. Sister? She's a singer and um, and yeah, she's a she's a great musician as well. And um, yeah, so we grew up singing in, in community choirs, although my official voice lesson started a little bit later. My sister was more of the singer, um, but whatever she did, I did and whatever I did, she did. So when Mackenzie started voice lessons, I started voice lessons with um, my voice teacher who now is, you know, your dear friend and great mentor, Diana Woolrich. Uh, so, and she was a, a huge influence, I would say, in mm. my singing. She and she, she not only was my voice teacher, but um, she directed the Juventus Choir. So she started this uh, community choir organization. We actually, I don't know how she did it, but when we started. We were in her studio in her house. Like I remember <laughs> sitting in her house, <laughs> and um, yeah, it was it was upper like a children's choir, upper voices. Uh, we did have a few boys here and there, but primarily girls. And mm -hmm. and we became this really close knit, very close, tightly knit community. Um, and you know, we 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 were we thought we were the best thing since sliced bread, and we were. That was the thing. <laughs> <laughs> How old are you at this point? Um, Hmm, no, I started singing, it would have been towards the end of grade eight, I think. Okay. So yeah, into going into grade nine, I was fully committed to Juventus. Yeah. So um, yeah, so Diana was a huge influence. Not only was Diana my choral director, but she, um, she hired, she still teaches and she hires accompanists um, to sit in on her lessons. So I, that was my job. She hired me to come in, I think I did two nights a week. Um, and I, you know, I don't know, I don't remember the times anymore, but like four till nine or something. Mm -hmm. And I'd sit there in a company for her voice students. And um, that I think helped my teaching and my knowledge about the voice and how various people respond to voice more than even I realized. <laughs> Cause I was sitting there playing, you know, at first the sight reading, you know, was, you know, but eventually you kind of get to know the repertoire and the canon and, and you've played these pieces over and over and, and you understand, um, you know, what she needs, what the student needs. And then you start to understand, you know, what they're doing, what the singer is doing and how they are able to fix it. And, and yeah, it, it, 
it, she became a really great um, teacher for me because I, I was sitting right there listening to her, you know, teach. And some of her students have done some really remarkable things um, and are, are, are really great, um, great performers right now. I don't know. Do you know Robin Dreger? She's a product of Yeah, Dutch we work together in uh, in Vancouver at the Vancouver yeah, Academy of Music. Yeah, yeah. yeah she's had a Robin. voice. Um, Alice, um, um, Alison Arends, do you know? Uh, we have met, I believe, once, and I follow her on Facebook. So. Well, there's some really yeah. big names out there, and, yeah. and they're all a product of her. So, so wow. yeah, so Diana, Diana was huge. Um, I, uh, my elementary school, uh, was a private uh, Seventh-day Adventist school. And everybody, the whole school, it was required, we had to be in band. Um, so I started playing flute in grade three uh, because I had to, I had to be in, in grade four was when we started band. And um, also we had chapel every day and everybody who played piano rotated playing for chapel. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that, also influenced me. This is Radomsky and, uh, you know, and, and what she did uh, in my elementary school. And I still am in touch with her and her family as well. And, and that's been a huge wow. influence. Um, my piano teacher, my flute teacher. Well, of course, then when I graduated university here at U of R, I did some work with Catherine Lauren. And um, she was really, um, she was a a firecracker of a conductor and just a great personality. Um, uh, and I learned a lot uh, from her about how to work with adults. Uh, and then she, she was very ambitious. She took us to, uh, well, before I started, the choir had gone to Wales and, and won like the chamber choir category mm -hmm. for <laughs> the yeah. Isted Bod Festival. And wow. then the year that I started, we were invited to ACDA in Chicago. It was, that was my first kind of major choral conference that I'd ever been to. And mm -hmm. for me, that was very significant. That was a time when um, the very first time I had heard of and seen the Moses Hogan Chorale. And uh, for me, that was that was like way better than even me being there as a performer, I think. <laughs> because uh, I was able to see this beautiful ensemble singing in this wonderful bel canto style, um, mm -hmm. all kinds of music. It was primarily spirituals uh, that were arranged by Moses Hogan. But wow. uh, I just, I'd never seen a, an all black choir with a black conductor. They had a soloist, a mezzo soprano that was mm -hmm. with them. They had a flutist and I played the flute um, who was fantastic. Uh, and yeah, everything about that concert just um, was inspiring. And so, so that was it. That was a huge, a huge uh, time in my life. Yeah. Uh, and then of course, grad school. Um, yeah. At my master's, I did with Victoria Meredith, and she is like just such an amazing person. Um, of course, super organized and just oh my goodness, like she just has everything you know the way yeah. that it should be. And so I learned a lot about writing from her, mm -hmm. uh, about you know being professional. Um, how to address singers, how to address the problem without talking too much, even though I still do that sometimes. <laughs> uh, and then uh, my doctorate, I've, I've been so blessed to study with um, Hilary Alpflestadt. We call her Dr. A, um, mm -hmm. all, all of the you know students, uh, but she she's very dear to my heart. Uh, just such a, again, fantastic person, extremely organized, mm -hmm. like super ambitious, super encouraging. Just, um, you know, uh, when I think there's no hope, she always sees the mm -hmm. silver lining and everything. And yeah, all, all of these people happen to be women and, and all mm -hmm. of these women have, have just been just a really strong pillar in my life, yeah. And and of course, you know, my mom and my grandmother and my yeah. aunt, my sister, like all of these people have, have played significant roles in my life. Yeah. As musicians, but it sounds like just as much as, as humans and as leaders yeah. and yeah. yeah. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, so Western and U of T, that's so exciting. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. I only learned that you went to Western when we were chatting yesterday and I just yeah. wish that I had overlapped with uh, Professor Meredith, but I know 
<laughs> or pass will cross at some point. Ooh, give her a call. I'm sure she'd be happy mm -hmm. to talk to you. <laughs> I should get her on here. <laughs> That's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll write that down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Melissa, you mentioned being inspired by seeing the, this Moses Hogan Corral at ACDA. Um, why was that significant to you? And how has that, how did that change your perspective going forward then? You know, it was significant for me because um, I, I had seen in magazines, um, American groups, that were primarily gospel uh, and I grew up listening to gospel mm -hmm. and participating in gospel and, you know, um, uh, but, but it wasn't the form that uh, I had studied, you know, and had planned to go to school for. Um, so when I went to ACDA, you know, I was, I was also, I'm very comfortable being um, the only person of color in a room, you know, mm. when I go to the symphony, oftentimes I'm the only person of color amongst, you know, a thousand people. Wow. Uh, when I go to podium, oftentimes, you know, I'm the only person of color there. So when I went to ACDA and I saw other people of color doing what I did, you know, and mm. taking seriously the art form that I love so much, um, that just was, that was just kind of cool. You know, it, it's, mm -hmm. it was just like, wow, like other people like me are doing this. I'm not the only one. Uh, so when I heard Moses Hogan Corral and just, they were so polished and so refined and just mm -hmm. fantastic and, and so down to earth after the concert, we, so my friend and I, she, uh, is a Filipino uh, person, and we were like the only minorities in Chamber Singers. Mm -hmm. So we, and we were like, you know, we're the minority. No, we weren't like that. I'm joking. <laughs> Anyways, Stella and I went to this uh, afterwards. We, we were like fans, you know, mm -hmm. just just the fan club, and and we shook Moses Hogan's hand. He gave oh. us a hug. He was so nice. He signed our programs um like he was like you can email me anytime oh. like he was just this normal person and i don't know you know when you're younger you kind of think people are more than they are you know but people are people um mm -hmm. and for me that was just inspiring that they looked like me they like did all these things and they were human like it, yeah. it just it, it it allowed me to recognize that um, you know, I mean, I had great teachers, uh, and, and I've been influenced by the best of the best. And, and I have no regrets about my upbringing, about my training, about my teachers. Um, you know, I, I believe I've had the best education any person on mm. earth could ever have. Um, but, you know, there's just something about recognizing when someone else, um, is like you. It's like if you're the only female in a field, and then all of a sudden you see another female walk in the room. You don't even. You don't care where right. they're from. You don't care. You're just mm -hmm. like, ah, thank you for being here. You know, you just get that feeling where right. you feel let's connect, and let's connected feel like mm -hmm. and important, and like, yes, there's other people like me doing what I'm doing and what I love. And for me, it was important that representation just gave me that extra bit of confidence and mm -hmm. vision for myself. And um, yeah, just, just allowed me to know that I can, I can move forward and I can do and be whatever I want to be. Right. And at such a high level, that representation too, Absolutely. like on a national stage singing yes. all kinds of repertoire at like the peak performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it it was important. That was really important. Mm. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> Well, um, I know you're being asked this a lot right now, and I thank you for encouraging me to take this conversation um, to the Black Lives Matter movement. And because I know as Canadians right now, and especially in the choral community, we're thinking a lot about how we can address issues of systemic racism and how we can participate in the Black Lives Matter conversation as choral musicians. And in Canada, it's sort of um, a unique perspective. And I know you've said, you know, you're often the only person of color at our national choral conference. And I, I hope that uh, isn't too big a burden for you to bear, but if you're willing to comment on that and what's what are your thoughts on that right now in this moment? You know, um, 
right now the world's attention is on uh, being diverse, uh, recognizing that systemic racism exists. It exists here in Canada, and we know that. Uh, and um, but we've ignored that. You know, mm. uh, we've ignored that. And 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 the, that this it's it's a terrible thing. Um, systemic racism. It's trauma, and when you've been traumatized, you, you want to do all you can to avoid it, you know. Mm. Um, and it's not like my fault; <laughs> it's not your fault. Um, mm. We, but it is something. Uh, when there's a problem, you have to address it. And like I said to you before, my whole life, I I've known. I mean, I woke up black uh, today and every day for the for my whole <laughs> life uh, it's not like the black lives matter movement suddenly made me recognize who i was um i've known this my whole life but i've also uh, been taught to not allow my skin to affect me and also not to talk about um mm. the problems because i don't want to create more problems for myself uh but but the truth is how can anybody move forward and how can real change happen if we don't have these discussions? And um, I don't come in a spirit of trying to blame. I don't think that's going to be productive. What we need to do as communities and as choral leaders is use the opportunity now. Now, while the whole world is focused um, and in a mind and a mindset to, to change, that that's it, it, it took years for this system to become where it is, and it's going to take years for this system to eventually erode away. So, so we have to start by accepting and acknowledging mm -hmm. that this exists. That's, that's the most important thing. And um, all parties need to do that. You know, all peoples need to do that. We see it huge in minorities, um, and especially what we're seeing in the United States, but here in Canada, in the indigenous communities, the missing and battered women, we've seen the Truth and Reconciliation um, document come forth, which has been wonderful, but there have been some steps that were said, were promised were going to happen that never happened mm. uh, coming out of that document. We need to revisit that and, and talk about what is going on? Why is it that some communities don't have clean water mm. in their communities? Like why, why that shouldn't happen that we live in such a beautiful country with so many resources. Mm. No one should go hungry or have to pay exorbitant fees for food because they live, you know, on in a Northern far Northern area or on a reserve or where, you know, whatever the problem is that should not exist in our country today. So, so we have to acknowledge, I believe, um, if we want to bring meaningful change, we have to make that mental shift. And the first thing is to accept and to acknowledge. And then we have to remember that, that we're human beings. So you have to treat you, these other people how you want to be treated. And, and you wouldn't do this, you know, um, you wouldn't think in a demeaning manner to your family. Uh, but we are all connected. We are all part of the human race. We are all family. So we, we have to know um, about our family. So get out there, um, find out who is in the community, get to know them, um, listen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, and when, when we can then know uh, the people who we want to you know, um, affect change with, then we make those meaningful connections and we can begin the process of healing. There's there's no quick, fast, easy remedy. Mm. It's 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 going to take the work of, of all of us together. Um, yeah, and, and as a choral leader, what does that mean? That means taking a look at who's in your choir and who's not in your choir and asking, why are you in my choir? Why are you not in my choir? Um, and why are do we not have more people of all races with us? What what is going on? What am I doing, and what mm. can I do? And then reach out to those communities and and find out what they what their life is like, and make that mm. connection. That's what I keep hearing from my colleagues as I have this conversation with people all over the country and in the states, and it's. And whenever I pose the question about what can we do in choral music, it always 
it's really just a human question. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's community, it's listen, it's reach out, it's um, research, it's, you know, learn and learn the history and talk to people. Mm -hmm. Um, So really the answer is, it sounds like what I'm gathering the way to, to change in our own little corner of the artistic world is, is actually, it starts with a very human and individual process um, and has nothing to do with choral music until that groundwork is done. Yeah. And I mean, even when we, you know, if I do something, for example, I had to prepare the Mozart Requiem in Germanic Latin. Mm. And, you know, my, my knowledge of Germanic Latin at the time was pretty limited. So what did I have to do? I had to go find the people yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who this was their area. And I spent lots of time with them. And uh, I read so many articles mm-hmm. and books, and then I practiced speaking, and then they listened to me and like, no, Melissa, it's like, the, <laughs> and then, right? Like I spent yeah. time, like months before mm-hmm. I even met the choir. And even while I was working with the choir, we were still working to improve uh, our diction. So if it takes that and much, you know, um, background work, which I loved and I did because mm-hmm. I knew that was the work that had to be done, then then we we know how to do this already. Yeah. We just have to accept and then decide that this is the steps that we're going to take and make a change and also accept it doesn't happen overnight. Mm-hmm. You know, um, these things take time. It's taken me my whole career <laughs> mm. to get to the level of the kind of musician that I am today. So, so that means this is a lifelong work. Yeah. And treating the music from all cultures that we program and perform Absolutely. with the same level of academic uh, pursuit and rigor. And yep. rigor. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. So you've worked with a lot of composers and you've developed a lot of relationships with composers as part of your research and your work. Um, Mm -hmm. I want to hear about your advice on starting those relationships. And I think we have some conductors watching today. How do you go about uh, starting? Actually, I know Hillary, uh, Dr. A is is watching. She says she's very proud of you. (laughs) <laughs> Aww. and we have a number of other just uh, fantastic choral leaders tuned in today welcome everybody um, Melissa tell us about that that relationship with composers that you have why is it important to work with real live people as a choral person yeah you know this all started my my journey working with um, live composers and primarily prairie composers started when I was doing my research at U of T. And uh, my my dissertation topic and research area was looking at trying to um, find identity within Mm -hmm. um, prairie choral music. And this started because as a child, we would sing the music of Elizabeth Rom, David McIntyre, um, you know, and others, uh, composers from this area. And then we, you know, we'd premiere a new work and then not really sing it um, unless there was some sort of occasion. Or I would go to conferences and not see the names of those composers programmed. Mm. And I thought, well, what is going on? Why, why are most of the composers from Ontario and from, you know, the Vancouver area, like, why are they more prominent than the center of the country? Now, the populations are bigger, so that makes sense. Uh, but, you know, uh, I wanted to sort of bring to the foreground some of these these composers and teachers that I knew and had studied with. So um, the nice thing is when you um, grow up in a community which is small, you really get to know the people in the community. And I developed, you know, Elizabeth Rom was my oboe teacher when oh, I was wow. in high school. <laughs> I think a great pen in oboe too. No, I, I, <laughs> that was just for fun. That was okay. a band. <laughs> That was just for fun, <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but I'd go over to her house and and we'd play and and you know and she was commissioned by our, the city and various organizations to write pieces here and there, and um, yeah. So I thought, well, this is going to be a good dissertation topic. I, and in fact, I could count on both hands how much had been written about um, specifically um, composers from from the Central Prairies. So yeah, um, it, it was important uh, to me because this is what's going on right now. Um, this, of course, yes, we learn from music of the past and we shouldn't stop singing music of the past. You know, Bach, Mozart, they will be there forever and they should be sung. But we also have some really wonderful new works by people who are just like you and me, um, you know, and you know maybe what it's like when you have this idea and you write it down and then someone else can bring it and breathe life into it. Um, and that was that was the awesome thing. And and for as a performer, you know, I, I had a choir, I had a community choir that that's what we did. We specialized in um, prairie chamber music. And uh, every time we did something um, where we could access the composer, which was pretty often, we either brought them into our rehearsal or, or at that time we, we did do a Skype rehearsal uh, if we could. And we learned so much about the music and ourselves. And then we became prideful about our province and about our community mm -hmm. because suddenly we, we came to appreciate the level of musicianship that was right here at home. Um, and, and that was important. That, that allowed us to be better musicians. Wow. And a really kind of uphold or highlight how choral music is a living breathing entity like it's not something that is stuck in the past but but it's a ever evolving mm -hmm. yes you hit so it cool. right on the nail yep right the nail right on the head yeah ever evolving absolutely yep. yeah. and and a part of our culture in a way that's um that's not in a museum you know it's it's a it's a part of ongoing Canadian culture and prairie culture. I know where I grew up in Newfoundland, like choral music is a huge part of my upbringing. And we talked about choral music as a cultural vessel. You know, we are transmitting our heritage through this singing, living, breathing art form. So exactly. And working with composers is uh, such a cool way to do that and to keep it so alive and be part of the creative process. Absolutely. It allows us to tell our stories. Mm. And and that that's that's what we're here. We're here to learn from each other through the stories that we tell in music. Mm -hmm. Wow. So when you're programming a concert, whether it's with new works that you've um, worked with a composer to develop or um, or with existing works or has, you know, Mozart or Bach, um, how do you go about programming a concert? What is your approach to to programming and does this change whether you're working with kids or university students or graduate students or adults or pros? This is a good question. Um, it's hard. <laughs> it is a difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, let me see here. I think, you know, as, as I get older and as I uh, sort of mature in my, in who I am and as a musician, um, I tend to, I think I look at the singers uh, and I determine what is going to help them to be the most successful. I think that's, that has become really important to me. Mm. Um, just understanding who is in my choir and, um, you know, what's going to give them that confidence um, and that um, going to help them to achieve um, success. Uh, and then I think about what is going to help them learn, learn a language, learn a movement, learn vowel shape, um, mm -hmm. be better with sustaining pitches, um, articulations, diction, you know, all of those good things. Uh, and so I, you know, that that's going through my mind. Um, I think about what is going to challenge me and um, what are some ways that I could teach and, um, that's going to be meaningful to the students. Mm. Uh, and then I think about what are some of the things that we can learn together? Maybe, maybe the piece is new to me and I, I don't really know it. So I, it, that allows me to delve in and unpackage and analyze and, 
get excited about the music so that I can share that excitement and um, with with the, with the group. So so there's several stages I think that I go through when programming. I I don't know if it changes between mm. adult to children. I think the process remains the same, but the outcome is a little bit different or the level, you know, of music, of course, will be different. But but the process that I go through, I, I don't think it's really that different. Interesting. That's very cool. And you're very um, cent centered around the, the experience of the singer, it sounds like, and the growth of the ensemble. And yeah, because um, for, you know, most of the time, People are joining the choir um, for that experience, for mm -hmm. the experience of community. Um, they uh, want to achieve a certain level of musicianship, of course, but um, you know they also are there because because I'm there, because their neighbor is there, because they love to hear, you know, and be with like-minded people. It's it, it's that community aspect which is pretty important, I think. So huge. And we're realizing how important that is yes. now in this pandemic more than ever. Yes. That it is so at the center of what we do as choirs. It is. It really is. Yeah. I know it, it brings us together. And I think when we kind of get back to being face to face in a choral rehearsal, we will never take for granted. Mm -hmm. You know, no one will ever be late for a rehearsal <laughs> ever again. I hope you're I'm right. For that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Everyone will bring pencils. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow i can't right. wait <laughs> pencils nobody will need a break to go to the washroom like we'll all just they'll be sitting at the edge of their chair <laughs> folders up <laughs> everything will be in tune That's, oh my goodness breath support <laughs> like <laughs> it'll just be like i can't wait i'm excited because i think we're <laughs> We're all kind of, you know, and the thing is right now, you know, I've done uh, just a small amount of these online Zoom rehearsals. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I'm in a rehearsal, I think I take it upon myself to hear and then to address what I hear, you know. But with this Zoom, I can't hear anything. Mm -hmm. Everybody's on mute and they have to be responsible for their own music making entirely. Yeah. Um, and... So I think this is this is good. This is making me understand, you know, it's time to allow the choristers to really be responsible. They can hear, they can help themselves and they're doing great. That means we can move a little bit faster. We can push the envelope a little bit more. That. Yes. <laughs> It's great. And they're getting confident and bold and, yeah. you know, making these virtual choirs is no joke. Like you awesome. have to get on there, be a soloist, yeah. uh, you know, make sure your face is engaged and it's a lot of work. So right. And then listen back to yourself and watch yourself. And <laughs> that's just sometimes the hardest part. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think you're right. Like instilling this independence mm -hmm. at the moment, which of course is, you know, it doesn't compare to the experience of singing together, but there are no. skills that we can grow right now. Exactly. Like yeah. Confidence, independence, um, use of technology, um, <laughs> all of those things that um, will hopefully, and, and, and of course, musicianship things that will hopefully make us all stronger choirs when we come out of this. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's what, and that's what we want, right? Stronger musicians. Yeah, when they leave, they need to be an even better musician, you know, than the equal to you, right? That's what that's what the goal is. I, I when I remember when I taught high school and um, at the end of the year, sometimes the grade twelves they would get together on their own and perform something that I might have said, oh, not this year, or mm -hmm. and that they would say, oh, but well, we're going to do it. <laughs> Anyway. And for me, that was that was that was such a proud moment because I thought, yes, you've taken all the skills that we've been talking about, even higher than the expectation that I had for you. You've yeah. taken it beyond, and you're now leading your own ensemble. You know, this is great. I don't need to be great. a part of this anymore. Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so we may have already even addressed this, but I was going to ask you, what are your hopes? for the future of 
choral music once we're through this dark woods here? Well, I just hope that more people sing. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I really do. I, I hope that more um, choral music is accessible um, to all people, to the marginalized, um, to the poor. Um, you know, I had a one-on-one -on -one um, at the Chorus America oh, online conference last week or a couple of weeks ago yeah. with Andre de, 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 de Catros. I, I think that's how you de say his last name. Yeah, yeah. And he's, he's the leader who brings music to people in prisons and, and that sort of thing. And our conversation was the most interesting uh, and really made me think about, you know, what, what could I do to bring choral music to communities outside of my comfort zone? Mm. And um, he, he really emphasized the fact that people have a story to tell. And when they can share their stories through music, they can be heard. And, and that's really the beginning of healing. And that's really what everybody wants, right? Everybody wants to be heard and everybody has a story to tell. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to um, singing. Yeah. <laughs> to, to just doing it and not, you know, having to make amends online and all of this. Um, I'm looking forward to the exciting new choral works. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every crisis generates a new art form, yep. <laughs> right? Hopefully art it's not the virtual choir. But it's <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it, it might become its thing. And if that's the case, that's the case. <laughs> art is always evolving. Uh, you know, we, we, we can't have beauty without struggle, you know? So, so I, I think the future is hopeful and that we will be better on the other side of this. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. Oh, I'm yeah. looking for questions here in our uh, comments. Mostly they are just comments oh, about wow. how lovely you are. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> if you're wow. listening, you're welcome to post a, a question for Melissa. Um, but in the meantime, I'll just highlight um, Jeanette Galland from Vancouver. Hi, Jeanette. Oh, she yeah. says, thank you for the thought, your thoughts on the BLM movement and how we might better respond as core leaders. Aw. Hi, Jeanette. <laughs> and Marla, also in Vancouver. Oh, Marla. She's my dear. <laughs> Marla was one of the first people I met in Vancouver. She sat next to me at uh, Ryerson United Church. It was my first real singing job. Wow. Yep. <laughs> oh, Allison left behind the scenes here is saying, how is it different working with youth choirs versus adult choirs? And uh, I'll let you address that first. And then she has another one. Could you just repeat that again? How yeah. is it different? How is it different? How do you find it different working with youth choirs versus adult choirs? You know, um, the majority of my career is spent teaching high school, and um, and and that age group is really the love of. I, I love working with that age, um, and I do love working with adults as well. Like I, I said, I had the Prairie Chamber Choir, and and they were just dear friends of mine, um, and so that was great that I got to make music with them. Um, the difference I don't think is is huge. Perhaps the pacing might be a little bit faster. Um, the Prairie Chamber Choir, they were very advanced singers. So, mm. you know, we could read music and, and get to polishing and interpretation and that sort of thing a lot faster than um, would happen with, you know, the youth choirs and the younger singers. But all of the basics that, you know, we need to do as singers, healthy breathing, posture, diction, focus, um, all of those things are the same across the board. And the expectation uh, for excellence in all of those areas is the same. So I would say there's not a massive difference between working with adults versus youth choirs. Uh, it might be the pacing, I think, that it would be the major mm. difference. But, but besides that, the basics of singing are the same. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Karen Burke has a question. Hi, Karen. Hey, yay, Karen, I love her. <laughs> Not sure if you address this, but would love to know how choral conductors can better support 
Black and Indigenous people of color singers in our choirs? Yes, that's such an important question. And, you know, Karen does some beautiful work with a gospel uh, choir. She is the, I think, founder, but for sure the conductor of the Toronto Mass Choir. And, you know, uh, we did talk about this a little bit earlier, but I think the first thing for conductors in the choral world to do is to acknowledge. Acknowledge that, um, that there is a problem with systemic racism uh, and maybe you just step away from your music and from choir mentality for a moment and and just be honest with yourself about what is happening in our world and and where do we fit um, then from then you take a look at the communities that you want to become closer to and more engaged and you want to um, you feel as though there's an area perhaps that you can reach out to and get to know those people. Um, get to know, you know, uh, someone said, I, I don't know how to reach the black community or I don't know how to reach the indigenous community or whichever community it is that you feel you wanna connect with. Look around, who are your friends? Um, if you don't have anybody from those communities as, as, as a friend, um, start there, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> start there and, and get to know, get to know people in your community and then look at your choir and see who is in your choir um, and, and then reach out to those people. I remember I had a, a strong, at, when I taught at Luther College High School, it, it was an international school. There were dorms, I, you know, there are dorms on the campus. So there were students who were from Germany, Nigeria, the Philippines, China, um, mm -hmm. you know. And so I remember my student would go home to Hong Kong and I said, could you bring me back a CD like of a choir at the university there? And then he would, and then I would find something on that CD and I'd say, would you teach us the language for this? And we're gonna do this song. And he, oh, you're going to sing this in my language? Like he was so excited. <laughs> and to teach his, like his, you know, fellow um, choristers, like that was, that was exciting. So, so look around and, and see, and, and then figure out what can you do to engage those singers. And um, you'll find that you're going to learn so much. I think I learned so much from others to help me in my programming and, and that sort of thing. And I can also do much more, which is what my goal is for the future. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Such great advice. Um, Sonia Williams says, excellent advice, Dr. M. Aw. <laughs> Oh, those are all my friends. <laughs> um, we have another question from Marla. And she says, so as we seek to amplify and respectfully celebrate the music of people of color and ensuring that we consult with the community and do the research that you've talked about, Important. are there areas of this music that you consider particularly sensitive in terms of performance by people who are not members of the black community? You know, I get this question a lot. I know I'm not black, can I sing a spiritual? Mm -hmm. um, the answer is, you know, what I, I what the first thing that I've done um, at, at most places where I have a choral library is just gone through and purged anything that is insensitive, that is dated, and, and this, you know, there's lots of music that because of the time, um, some of the text is not appropriate. Uh, and so go through your library and, and get rid of anything that is not appropriate anymore for any race. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and there's, there, there are lots of pieces that, you know, we, we can pull out, but, but purge out the stuff that is obviously offensive and wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then once you do that, then if there is something that you see um, that you'd like to perform, uh, music is is meant to be performed for for everyone. You know, a, a composer, I, I don't know, and maybe I'm stepping some boundaries here, but I don't know of anybody who would write something and then say, I don't want, you know, yellow people to sing this. I don't want white people to sing this. I no, that's not the aim of the, the the aim is that the story, the the thought, the idea, the message that the composer has, that the poet has, 
that message needs to be heard and shared by all. So, so once you've, you know, gotten rid of what is obviously wrong and, you know, racist or, you know, just not appropriate, once you've done that, then, then just approach the music in the same way that you would, you know, um, a, a, a Bach motet, or the same way that you would something in a culture or a language that you're not familiar with. You're going to, you're going to do the work. You're going to research. You're going to contact people who are familiar with the style, with the language, and you might have them come in and be a guest and, and mm -hmm. learn all you can. Go spend some time you know, there's so many workshops, even right now, just free mm -hmm. things, right? Like that you can just go online and and learn. And once you do that and you're comfortable and confident, you perform that music, but also let people know the work that you did. Talk about that, do a pre-concert chat and explain mm -hmm. the process that you went through or, you know, talk to your singers, do all of the things and celebrate what the work that it went in to make your performance happen. So I, I don't think that you, anyone should ban, you know, um, a human being from performing a piece of music. You mm -hmm. know, there are some instances, you know, where you have to be gifted a song, you know, don't take someone else's music mm -hmm. without permission, um, but that's part of doing the work. Uh, mm -hmm. So once, once you've done that, once you've done your homework, so to speak, then you should perform it. Yeah, absolutely. Do it. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever involve the singers in that process? Oh, you have to because mm. they have to know what they're performing about. Yes, they they have to. We we all go through this together, right? And and that's the beauty of choral music. That's why we love it so much, um, because because everybody has a, a part to play. Everybody has a role, and and collectively, our knowledge together is what generates the energy and um, the beauty of, of the art form. Wow, Melissa, I'm just so thankful for your insight today. I, I'm oh, over overwhelmed with uh, advice and uh, profound words. Oh, uh, so, <laughs> you're so I can't wait to just go, you're awesome. to go reflect on this. <laughs> Um, there's so much to take away here um, you. and you're doing such amazing work and we're just so thankful that you shared it with us today. No, thank you. I'm, I feel really blessed to, well, I mean, we, I met you first when you came to Regina with Big Choir. Right, with Choir. Like and we over, learned we have the same birthday. Yes, we're twins and mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I'm just proud of the work that you're, you are doing. You are oh, doing some you, fantastic Lisa. Things and representing our country so well, and and this this series is awesome because people we get to learn about all of these. You know, when you had Simon Carrington on there, I was like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> amazing! And Andrew Belfer, I, I mean, I did I did research, you know, on him and to yeah. hear him speak, and all of these people. Like, it's just been amazing. So you're doing great work. I feel blessed to just that you even asked me to do this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Well, let's do it again sometime. I'm Absolutely. having a blast. It's really just a chance <laughs> to chat with people I want to learn from. So I really, really appreciate your time. And thank, thank you, everybody, you. for listening. Yeah. Uh, take care and good luck with everything. Thank you. You too. Have a great summer. Bye. <laughs> Bye.